Hello, I come to you once again, bearing yet another book. M.R. James, Count Magnus, and Other Ghost Stories. I picked this book up um, quite a while ago. Uh, in fact, I have a lot of OG, unedited Cla Penguin classic books. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the back to you first, and then I'm going to read the essay, or at least begin reading the essay that this is a part of. Um, so, a collection of classic ghost stories from the visionary master of supernatural fiction. I'm speaking loud because my dogs are barking in the background, and I'm not going to quit recording. M.R. James, referred to by H.P. Lovecraft as one of the few... Really creative masters in his darksome providence was a pioneer in the history of the English ghost story, transforming the ghost from a wispy, ethereal figure into an aggressive, malevolent, and all too palpable force of evil. The only annotated edition of M.R. James' writings currently available, Count Magnus and Other Ghost Stories, is both the culmination of the 19th century ghost story tradition and the inspiration for much of the, of the best 20th century work in this genre. Included in this collection are such landmark tales as Count Magnus, set in the wilds of Sweden, Casting the Ruins, Casting, yeah, Casting the Ruins, a rich, complex tale of sorcery that served as the basis for the classic horror film Curse of the Demon, and O oh, Whistle, and I'll Come to You, My Lad, one of the most frightening tales in literature. The appendix includes several rare texts, including A Knight in King's College Chapel, James' first known ghost story. Pretty cool. I have yet to read this, um, so let me get to the introduction. Let's just had some cereal. Got the burps. Um, all right, introduction. In one sense, it is exceptionally odd that M. R. James, eighteen sixty two to nineteen thirty six would become the leading 20th century author of ghost stories. In another sense, especially when we consider the, story, the sort of ghost stories James came to write, it seems eminently natural and inevitable. James led a double, perhaps a triple life, first as one of the most distinguished scholars of medieval manuscripts in early Christianity of his time, second as a noted professor and administrator at Cambridge University, and then at Eton College, and finally as a writer of ghost stories. It is no surprise that only that last body of work continues to attract the attention and fascination of readers worldwide. James's scholarship, although fundamentally sound, has been largely superseded and is in any event its audience is necessarily limited to a small cadre of the learned, whereas the ghost stories are of universal appeal and have never been surpassed by those many authors who have chosen to pay them tribute by imitation. Montague, Montague Rhodes James was born in August 1st, 1862 at the, the Vicarage of Goodnestone in Kent, the fourth child and third son of Herbert and Mary Emily James. Three years later, Herbert was transferred to Livermere Hall near Bury St. Edmunds in Suffolk, in, Suffolk, in Suffolk a home that remained in the James family until Herbert's death in 1909 and remained close to M.R. James' heart long after that. Herbert had fallen under the influence of the evangelical movement of the time, but there is little evidence that his children became doctrinaire or fundamentalists in their religion. Indeed, it was a lasting disappointment for Herbert when Montague eventually decided not to pursue holy orders. The young Montague received his first education the young Montague received his education first at Temple Grove Preparatory School, then Eton College, where he gained a lifelong attachment to his tutor, Henry L. Ford Luxmore. Luxmore may have seen in James, who was already exhibiting an interest in what might be called biblical archaeology, not notably the apocryphal books of the Old and New Testament and the apocalyptic literature of early Middle Ages the wide-ranging scholar that he did not have the opportunity to be. At the same time, Eaton was also James' initial interest in the ghost story. In a letter to his parents, he speaks of stumbling upon the work of medieval writer Walter Mapp, 
whose De Nugis Carillium James would later edit and translate, which contains some extraordinary stories about ghosts, vampires, wood nymphs, etc. His reading of the great Irish supernaturalist Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, who would remain his favorite writer of horror tales, also dates to his Eden days. There is evidence that he wrote, or at any rate told, his first ghost stories as early as 1878. Certainly by 1880, when the Eaton Rambler published his essay on ghost stories, see appendix, his interest was well established. But for the time being, scholarship was paramount. It was inevitable that after graduating from Eaton, James would, attend, would advance to King's College, Cambridge. For centuries, King's had been a closed corporation reserved exclusively for graduates of Eton, and even after the reforms of 1861, it was still largely an Etonian preserve. James's years at collegi as a collegian at King's, 1882-87, to saw the flowering of his interest in biblical curiosa, medieval manuscripts, and church history. This work only contained... This work only continued when James was successfully named Fellow... Fellowship of the Ring, yeah, J.R.R. Tolkien, same thing, 1887, Dean, 1889, and finally Tudor, 1900, of Kings. His first scholarly article has been published as early as 1879, but beginning in 1887, he commenced a series of publications, books, monologues, mo I'm sorry, books, monographs, editions, articles, and reviews that would not cease until his death. In 1893, James also became a director of the Fitzwilliam Museum at Cambridge, a post he would hold until 1908. How exactly James found the time for all this work, let alone the writing of ghost stories, was a puzzle to friends and colleagues alike, especially when one considers James's other interests, his devotions to Dickens, P.G. Wodehouse, and Conan Doyle Sherlock's home stories, his interest in card games and crossword puzzles, and of course the abundant conviviality he showed to his friends, students, and almost any other in and almost any others who came within his horizon. A charming and often told anecdote get, gets to the heart of the matter. When Monty was in his early thirties, Lord Acton came here to King's. You know Montague James, he asked a King's man. Yes, I know him. Is it true that he al is it true that he is ready to spend every evening playing games or talking with undergraduates? Yes, the evenings and more. And do you know that in knowledge of MSS, he is already third or fourth in Europe? I'm interested to hear you say so, sir. Then how does he manage it? We have not yet found out. Pretty wild. The matter becomes even more baffling when we consider the extensive travel in which James engaged from an early, as early as 1892 when he took his first bicycle tour of the continent. From 1895 to 1914, he took at least one trip to France a year, chiefly for the purpose of examining medieval cathedrals. He would later maintain that he had personally seen 141 out of the 143 extent, extant cathedrals in France. Trips to Scandinavia followed in 1899 and 1900. James's ghost stories were manifestly an amusement of his lighter hours, although they need not be esteemed lightly on that account. We may date the commencement of his supernatural writing to the rather, rather frivolous tale, A Night in King's College Chapel, probably written in 1892, but it was not long before he produced weightier work. A celebrated meeting of the Chit Chat Society, a literary and social group at Cambridge, on October 28, 19, 1893, saw James read his two earliest ghost stories, Canon Albrecht's Scrapbook and Lost Hearts. Thus began a long tradition extending well into the 1920s when James would read drafts of his tales to a succession of friends, collegians, and other groups, usually at Christmas time. Although these first two stories were published in magazines in 1895, James would very likely not have considered book publication of his tales had not a close friend, James McBride, undertaken the task of illustrating several of them. McBride's sudden death in 1904, after contemplating only four illustrations, appears to have led James to issue Ghost Stories of the Antiquary, 1904, as a tribute to his friend's memory. A year after the volume came out, James was made provost of King's College. It proved to be a difficult assignment. Not only had he been selected only after two others had declined the post, but the tedium of administration work began to weigh upon his temperament. 
It was also at this time that a struggle between the pious and the ungodly began to emerge for control of Cambridge's intellectual cultures. James, manifestly on the side of the pious, was notably uncharitable towards such of his ungodly Cambridge colleagues as James Fraser, as James George Fraser and Bertrand Russell. The war years were particularly stressful. Cambridge seemed emptied of its finest youth, youths, many of whom, such as Rupert Brooke, whose participation in Cambridge theatricals had attracted James's administration, left their bodies on the battlefields of France. Although a second volume of tales, most more ghost stories of the antiquary, appeared in 1911, along with an array of impressive scholarly works, this was a markedly unhappy time in James's life. The return to Eden in 1918, this time as provost, could only have been a relief. As provost of Kings, James had been criticized for failing to be an intellectual pioneer. His scholarship seemed increasingly remote and unrelated to present-day concerns. A close friend, A.C. Benson, who had known James since his Eton days, wrote somewhat uncharitably in his diary. His mind is the mind of a nice child. He hates and fears all problems, all speculation, all originality or no novelty of view. His spirit is both timid and unadventurous. Wow, geez. Not very nice, AC. Eden was, however, exactly the place for James. His instinctive empathy with the enchantments and travails of schoolboy life, the unaffectedly avuncular or even grandfatherly air he exhibited, and the prodigious learning that he carried so unassumingly were perfectly suited to the education of British youth. Administrative mun mundanities, mundane mundanities, I didn't even know the word, were, safety, were safely in the hands of the headmaster. James, although he faced the terror of dining with the king and queen once every year, could devote himself wholly to nurturing his charges with quiet encouragement. It was during his provost, provostship that his two final collections of ghost stories, A Thin Ghost and A Warning of the Curious, appeared, following by the gathering of all four volumes, plus a few additional tales, as the collected ghost stories of M.R. James, 1931. Such, impor such important works of scholarship as the Apocryphal New Testament, 1924, and such popular works as The Wonderings in Homes of Manuscripts, 1919, and Abbey's, 1925, also appeared. James's learning of the Danish language paid dividends when he translated some of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales into English in 1930. In 1925, he completed the prodigious task, begun informally as early as 1884, of cataloging all the manuscripts of the Cambridge Colleges. Honors were shown upon him later in life. He became a trustee of the British Museum in 1925. He was awarded honorary degrees from Oxford and Cambridge. And as a capstone in 1930, he received the Order of Merit from King, King George V. Wow. James's later years were plagued with increasing ill health, and he died on June 12, 1936. His headstone bears the words of Ephesians 2.19, No longer a sojourner, but a fellow citizen with the saints and of the household of God. And that's, you can see there's a break. There's a break, so... Ah, uh, you got a few pages there I read to you. Two, three, four, about five pages. Um, if, if it interests you, um, well, it interests me. Um, I will, I will read some of these not right now um it's so good we're at 14 minutes which is pretty long um check this out um this is the og penguin classics this is not an edited version this is unedited the way it was intended to be read and um well that's it until next time check out some mr james if you haven't and uh have a good day